Uh, so today we're going to talk about DevOps. Um, the title of the talk is DevOps Still a Thing. Uh, hopefully by the time of the package, we'll have a conclusive answer. Um, so, uh, so how do we get here? Uh, it's been, it's going to be 10 years next month, I think on this day, uh, that uh, John Hammond and, uh, uh, that, that, sorry, that John Ellis Paul and Paul Hammond gave their talk. Uh, September was a day, uh, Dev and Operations, Cooperation and Dev Cover. So when I thought about this talk and the title, I really thought about what pressing concerns were at the time. So depending on how you made this, or a decade or more in, uh, to what has been described as a tooling revolution, social revolution, maybe it's a little bit of all of those things. Uh, and so what were the pressing concerns at the time? So at the time that, uh, that John Elspaugh and Paul Hammond were giving their talk, they were trying to deploy, they were trying to keep up with the, uh, with the sudden success of Flickr. Uh, do you guys remember what Flickr was? Or did? It's a photo sharing application. Um, like a lot of web apps at that time, suddenly it was, uh, like, I don't even remember Netflix, it was just like a bunch of, uh, it was like really key content that they got from uh, one cable provider. They had a handful of movies that no one really wanted to watch, and put them up there and said, this stuff is as well. Right? And suddenly people were doing it largely because they could get access to, to video, even though it like, stuttered, it was terrible, and it was a thing you could do with the web that you could do before. And Flickr allowed you to store your photos basically for free, or for at least a very low cost on the internet, and that was very useful. And so very quickly, this web app had to scale. And so, uh, uh, John Elspaugh was the head of operations at Flickr, and Paul Hammond was the head of development. And they had that kind of basic 90s model of how dev and ops interact. Um, I'm sad to say that even 10 years down the road in DevOps, that model is still largely prevalent. Um, it's hard to think about because we know about all the unicorns, right? But um, there's a lot of horses and ponies uh, and mules uh, in that same mix. So. Uh, Anyway, um, so we had a handful of web apps 10 years ago that suddenly hit scale, and the model that we had, which uh, was the plan, build, run, and maintain model, suddenly didn't work. It was too slow. Uh, the speed with which uh, infrastructure needed to be added to support the user demand uh, was, was simply too high. So new modes of working had to emerge. All right, so um, in that talk, there, there's a lot of details, and it's interesting. Um, it, it, I would encourage you, if you haven't seen the talk, to go and find it on YouTube. It's, um, it was at the Velocity Conference, uh, 2009, uh, June 22nd. Uh, and in that talk, there are a number of interesting things. So Flickr, I don't know if you, you, if you remember Flickr, even if you don't, uh, Flickr was, was the, a byproduct of a failed game. So there was a game, and the game allowed you to upload photos to it. That whole mechanism, the game failed. The, the people that made Flickr uh, really wanted to make commercial video games, but were really struggling to do that successfully. But what did work was the photo sharing. So they made that, uh, they made that available. That became a valid business model, and, and they went on to make quite a bit of money. Uh, that same group of people went back and invested in a new video game uh, that was called Glitch. Glitch, also very interesting. Um, it did quite a bit in terms of uh, communication channels within the game. So it was all web-based, it was a side-scroller. Uh, and the thing that was most interesting about the game is the way that you communicated with other players and the way that you talked about what was happening in the game. And the way you did that was by sharing URLs to nearly everything. Uh, so any conversation that had ever been had could be linked back to. If you're following me, <laughs> you might have an idea of what that failed game company created. But before I, before I say what it was, I'll tell you that, that in, uh, in the talk, John talks about the value of putting the IRC logs into a searchable format and making them available to both developers and operations people. And I just love that fact because the, the next iteration of Flickr, uh, Glitch, became Slack. So if you were using HipChat and you were piping your logs into it, you, you already had an idea of how this works. The, the very first conversation about that was there. And then now if you're using Slack, you understand exactly how that works. So there's probably nobody, uh, nobody that does it now, but at the time it was, it was prescient. 
Uh, anyway, I maintain that they are covering three basic areas of change that were required to deal with scale. Those areas are culture, process, and tooling. Um, so we can work forward and we can work backward in terms of how we achieve the outcomes necessary here. So we can create a culture, like a learning culture, in which communication uh, and respect for our colleagues um, and alignment around goals exists. And then we can build processes that help uh, make the work transparent uh, and that help keep the priorities aligned. And then we can buy or build tooling that helps support our delivery needs. Or we can create tooling that helps automate and, and define how we, get our, um, how we get our code out into the world. We can then create process around all of the things that we cannot automate. And then we have a culture that ends up being largely transparent and values respect in the workplace. So you can come at this in either way. But here's the fact. 10 years ago, that, is not, that was not the experience that most of us were having at work. Um, I, I remember spending, and I'm sure this still happens today, quite a bit of my time talking to developers when I was an operations engineer at 3 in the morning about why the fuck is this thing broken? Sorry. Oh. Uh, I swear quite a bit. Is, uh, is salty old man going to be a problem for anybody? OK, good. So, <laughs> So, and hearing, this, and hearing this dude say, well, you know, uh, it worked on my laptop. I don't know why it's broken. What's wrong with your server? Uh, so having those arguments at 3 AM, while super fun, was not highly productive, right? Uh, so uh, what, we needed was, uh, what we needed was a way in to a cultural change. But it wasn't just going to be culture, right? Because at the end of the day, we needed to address scale. All right. So, um, so let's start with culture, because I had to pick a way to go. In order to start culture, in order to make a cultural change of any significance, we have to first embrace the fact that the people that we work with are whole, capable, and intelligent. Uh, I'm really happy that I'm not seeing the response I expected. Normally, when I share this to a bit, um, I get a more visceral response from the people that are seeing it. It is not the ordinary way that we think or communicate about our colleagues, right? Those doofuses over there, those doofi, I guess it would be, over there, are the reason that I'm up at 2 in the morning. There's nothing, they're broken, <laughs> they're incapable, and they definitely are not intelligent, right? But we have to transform that view if we're going to make the culture change. The only way that we can build trust is by demonstrating, uh, demonstrating competence and capability so we have a little bit of a dilemma. So the way that I advocate uh, for starting this process is, is literally to, to drop it. And this is to, to drop the perspective and to adopt a new perspective. The only way that that call at 3 in the morning, if that, to the extent that that's still a concern, is going to end is if I can communicate effectively with the person on the other side. So whether I'm the software engineer who needs to understand how the build and release process works, or whether I'm the operations engineer who, understands, who needs to understand what's happening below the hood, I need to be able to effectively communicate with the other side. I still strongly advocate, by the way, for a strong separation of concerns. I believe that operations is fundamentally different than software engineering. And while they share a, a common set of, um, of tooling and practices, they are, at the end of the day, separate disciplines that have their own value. I don't really love the version where we just try to mash everybody together. I think Jody was talking about, like, let's be agile, and that means shoving. I've seen, like, agile adoption things that sh sh literally shoves every conceivable job title into, like, one software development team. Wait, first of all, who could afford that, right? Your, <laughs> your, your, your day one cost for a team of 40 people business analysts, VPs, like all of the people they want to shove in there would be ridiculous. But more importantly, uh, it dishonors the disciplines. Right? There are things that operations people need to care about and talk to each other about that software developers may have interest in, but it's not their core concern, and vice versa. But I would say that those differences are much smaller, and we should build on the, uh, on the commonalities. All right, so we're in, we're in good shape, right? The other thing is, if you're managing people, and anywhere in your organization you think there's a group of idiots, we have a huge problem, right? Because we've spent a lot of time and money to attract the best people we could find. <laughs> so if there's anybody in your organization running around talking about those goofs over there, you, you either have them, 
which would be a significant problem. You've overinvested in people who are undercapable, which is unlikely. Or you are, you are bleeding money because people don't know how to communicate effectively with each other. OK. So, uh, so we talked about uh, people. Let's talk about what causes the issue. So I think this is still true today. Change is the number one problem in our environment. If only things could remain the same, everything would be great. Right, right Jody, we just go back to the last deploy, everything's good. Uh, but that's unlikely to happen. So 10 deploys a day seemed like a crazy number. I remember when, when John blurted out 10 plus deploys, and there were, literally, there were people in the audience who literally gasped. How could that be possible? If you have any kind of like huge deploy train, or you have a bunch of big dependencies, or you have a monolithic application, this just sounds crazy. To ten, why would I do that 10 times a day? How would I do that 10 times a day? I've worked with banks that take many months to get their release train in order, and then they have a big like week-long crazy crush to get that code out. Uh, we can talk about the efficacy of that, but that is still a fact for those institutions, right? Uh, the thing that we need to know is that constant change makes things brittle. Knowing that makes, commu makes, makes communication even more important. Right? Alternately, like bending and straightening a thing is an algorithm or snapping it in half. So the more change we introduce, the more likely we are to break things, the more important it is for us to be able to discuss the differences so we know what to do. Are you with me so far? Good? All right. Trust that everyone is going to do their best. This means we don't build processes that are designed to keep to uh, obscure or keep the uh, internals of the system away from other people. This does not mean that we don't adhere to um, that we don't adhere to audit, auditing rules or, 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 or other rules. Meaning, it does not mean that a person who shouldn't punch the button or shouldn't have access to the box gets in. What it does mean is that we need to make sure that there's nothing that a person can't know, that they need to know in order to be effective. Right. Still with me? Jody, I thought you'd get mad about that one. You good? All right. Yeah. All right. Trust but verify. Exactly. Yeah, spec knots, right? Yeah, exactly. All right. Um, create a culture of respect and avoid stereotypes. This is important in a number of different directions. So on the surface, I'm talking about inclusion and diversity, but I'm also talking about the ridiculous stereotypes that get applied to people just based on their job role. The idea that we're nerds because we interact with a computer, um, this drives me the most crazy. Or that we're, we're socially fucked up because we, you know, look, the reason that we sit with a single screen in front of us and we type on a, on a thing that looks like a typewriter has everything to do with the history of computation. It has nothing to do with the personalities of the people that do it. Now, you could be an introvert, you could be an extrovert, and that's who you are, but it is not a, pro it is not a product of the fact that you work in tech, right? It is a characteristic that you hold as a human. Um, so the, the thing that I really hate is, is having someone look at, if we, could have if we could design a device today to do what we needed to do, it would look nothing like the computers that we use, right? Software is largely a team sport now, so it would probably be like a single, I don't know, it'd be an array of monitors and maybe one giant, I don't know what it would look like, but it wouldn't look like, I keep pointing to that poor guy, it wouldn't look like his computer. Uh, but it looks that way because we started with the teletype and we move forward. Uh, I like when people get all excited about digital, like it's the new thing, because uh, you may remember, maybe don't, uh, we got the word digital as a joke about what they were going to call pulse technology. So when we wanted a machine gun to fire more rapidly, we used math and electrical signaling to make that happen. Uh, they were going to call it pulse signaling, but someone said, oh, you should call it digital. It was a joke, because the math that computers do is second grade level math, right? We, we think about how smart they are, but at the, at the end of the day, computers aren't that smart. It's just like having 10 bazillion second graders all doing math for you simultaneously, which is a powerful thing, but it's not the same thing as smart. So the joke was it's digital, meaning it, the, the, the machine that makes this happen still has to count on its fingers and toes. So the next time someone hypes you up on a digital transformation, you can, you can share that bit of history with them. Uh, anyway, the point here is to be able to seek, uh, seek input 
and to seek feedback and to be able to give it freely. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a, in a minute. Uh, last is create a blameless culture. It is impossible, I think, to deal with failure. So if you're in an organization, there's someone in there, I am absolutely sure, who's going to tell you that they want you to fail. And uh, most organizations do not act like they actually want you to fail. And in fact, in many organizations, it is not at all safe to fail. Uh, my, my, my partner, Brian, and I, we were, we were talking today, and I was just remembering some of the, the, the big sort of fuck ups that I did, uh, especially as an operations engineer. Uh, I once decided to automate uh, the process by which core files on, on, a, on an E10K, a uh, big Sun server back in the day, I, I wanted to automate the process of like zipping up and shipping off the core files to Sun to get feedback. So I wrote some Perl to handle that and let it fly. And I was very happy about that because it gave me the whole rest of the day to sit back and basically do nothing. I think I opened up one of those O'Reilly books. I was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kick back today. And then my phone, uh, rang, because at my desk I had a phone back then. And I put it up to my face and my boss said, uh, please, please scoot your chair back away from the keyboard. We have something to talk about. And the thing that we had to talk about was the fact that I had deleted the kernel from the running box. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, so look, in a blame environment, that conversation would have gone very differently. Luckily I was in an environment that, that did not focus on blame. So he and I worked together to rebuild that kernel, which was a dicey proposition, but it ended up working out. Um, it could have been that I was going to be there for the rest of the night pumping uh, diskettes into that box and rebuilding the, the OS from scratch, but I didn't have to do that. Um, but in that conversation, we talked about how to resolve the problem. There was not one moment where my boss at the time focused on the fact that I fucked up or that I was to blame or what the repercussions of this might be or what he thought might happen to his career as a result of it. We focused on the problem, we worked through it, and we resolved it, which is what adults do. All right, so blameless culture. Uh, what does a blameless culture look like? Uh, John Alspaugh, again, I, a huge fan. He is the uh, head of operations at Etsy, if you don't, if you don't know who he is. Uh, he's written quite a bit on uh, blameless culture, just culture, uh, and blameless postmortems. And so in a blameless environment, this is what you are able to do. Uh, you are able to, without fear of punishment or retribution, discuss a failure and talk about the actions that were taken at the time, the effects as they were observed, the expectations that were held. John maintains that no one, no accident happens because a human thinks, I'm going to break this thing. That's a that's special cause variation for, for you lean heads out there, right? The idea that someone just threw a wrench in it because they're an anarchist is pretty low. The person who made the mistake felt that what they were doing was worth the risk, or they did not fully appreciate or understand the risk at the time, right? So they did it because they felt like the thing they're about to do was going to have a good outcome, not a bad outcome. If they had thought it was going to have a bad outcome, they would have done something completely different. And we have to take that perspective. So we, in order to understand what happened, we need to understand the working assumptions so that we can figure out the problem. And we also need to understand the timeline. Uh, John created a tool called the um, Crips, the Morg, the Morg, I think it's the Morg, uh, that allows you to combine, com combine all of your logs and really prep. It's a little web application, it's free, uh, and it helps you to prepare for and set up your postmortems. So again, I highly recommend that you read it. All right, so where are we now? We are, people are whole, capable, and intelligent, right? Uh, we don't break things on purpose. We need good, clear communication in order to resolve issues. Um, and so how do we do that inside of an organization that is probably not doing that very well? Um, in order to understand why communication inside organizations sucks, we have to think a little bit about, um, about the sociology of the organization. So Mel Conway was a software engineer. Uh, he, does anyone know Conway's law? Nobody knows, yes. You know Conway's law? Can you, can you paraphrase really quickly? Anybody? Okay, so here's what Mel said. Mel said, uh, uh, if, I give, if I ask four teams to build a compiler, they will make me a four phase compiler. That's the, the summary of, of his law is, is that the, our communication interfaces define the results of our work. Make sense? 
So your organization is the history of its communication patterns. Communication patterns inside of organizations become structures. If you've ever been in a startup, everybody does everything, right? Over time, people accrue titles, structures start to form based on the language. I think we need a VP of what the fuck, right? Pretty soon, you have a VP of what the fuck. And that person, because they're a VP, needs people working for them, and suddenly these structures emerge. And when you walk into an organization, what are you confronted with first? You're confronted with the structure. So we all know how to respond to structure. We do what the structure indicates it should do. It's a signifier for power. It's a signifier for decision making. Uh, it's a signifier for authority. Right? I would advocate if you want to create a good environment, walk in, confront the structures that exist, ask them to, um, ask them to justify themselves. And when they cannot justify, and I don't mean the people, I mean the structures. When they cannot justify themselves, Tear them down, preferably from the bottom. Right? Because the structures are the history of your communication, many of them, uh, I used to play a game when, when I do these sort of DevOps transformations where I would ask a team to name the most onerous rule in their organization. What's the thing that drives you the most crazy? And you know, everybody's hand goes up and they're like, we can't do this, we have to do that. And they're asking to tell me, do you know the history or is it a mystery? Give them time, and be like, who? Who wrote the rule? What was the thing that formed the rule? And uniformly, very rare that someone could say exactly what, what brought the rule about. Almost always a mystery. So it's an artifact of history, and that history has long been lost, but it still remains. So if you have processes in your, in your, release, in your release cadence that are a mystery to you, but they're because somebody fucked up like in 1942, and we don't want that fuck up to happen again, you're creating your own version of, of, of Conway's law. Silos in organizations beget supervision. So you have these structures and you have these rules, and then people are afraid. We don't want to fuck up like we did in the 40s. So what do we need to do? We need to create rules to prevent that from happening. Worse, we create organizational boundaries that no one can trespass in order to prevent these kinds of problems. Um, I don't know who I said this to earlier, but I did some work at a bank in South Africa uh, that was hit very, very hard during its, uh, during its maintenance window. So uh, you know how ATMs work? There's two machines inside the ATM that kind of talk to each other. Uh, some information can pass, others cannot. Uh, and this is to provide safety. Anyway, they, they have, they've really thought very carefully about how the ATM should work. Here's what they did not think carefully about, how their organization should work. So everybody knows that right before the bank holidays, they do the big push, they push the new code out. So their release train comes right up to the edge of the week-long vacation everybody's gonna take. They do like a 24, 48, sometimes a week-long push. They get all the new code out to all the parts of the bank that need it, and then everybody splits for a week and they go on vacation. Um, so while I was in Africa working with this bank, they lost a two, 200 million or 20 million dollars. $20 million, over 2,000 ATMs were hit simultaneously during their maintenance window. This was an artifact of their organizational history. It was not like, it was, there is no blame other than the fact that they had accrued all these rules and processes and simply kept them uh, because they existed. It's the strongest and most compelling reason to always be reviewing why you do things. You know that annoying person that always asks why? Promote that person. <laughs> they might save you $20 million. Uh, OK, so the other thing I want to talk about here is, is the, the element of supervision. So I'm going to tell you a, a funny or not so funny story, depending on your perspective. Uh, I call this the U-shaped uh, escalation. So uh, I'm a software developer, and I'm working with another software developer in another part of the, uh, of the organization. And I need some work from that person. So uh, I do what we all do, right? Uh, I saunter over to her desk. I look at the, uh, the accoutrement on the desk, and I'm like, oh, you like cats. Cats are amazing. I like cats, too. Also, I need a favor. <laughs> Can you help me out with a thing that only your department does? And they say, like, you like cats? What, what wouldn't I do for a cat lover? 
And so maybe, maybe it's actually a better way to talk about this. Maybe I need a, maybe I need a server. I need a, uh, I need a dev environment. Well, you know, we have this really heinous process that you have to go through to get a dev server, but I know someone that can hook you up with one. I'm going to give you the dev server. So they agree to do you the favor because you're a nice person, and then what do you get? Anybody? You have to return a favor at some point? Not yet. What you get is half a development server, <laughs> right? They give you an IP address. Maybe you can log in, maybe you can't. Maybe it has the stuff you asked for on it, maybe it doesn't. So in this case, it doesn't have the things you need, maybe you, maybe, but maybe you can log in. So what do you have to do? You have to walk back over and you have to say, hey, thank you so much for building that server for me. Uh, I can't install the software on it that I need. Remember I told you I had this list of things that I needed. Uh, there's like seven things that aren't in there. Do you, I like cats, remember me? I'm the person who likes cats. Can you hook that thing up? And they're like, uh. You know, I, I did you kind of a favor. I'm really not supposed to do that. Uh, I got a lot on my plate right now. And you're like, cats are amazing. <laughs> so they agree to do it. Uh, and then you get an email. Maybe you get it a week later. Maybe you get it an hour later. Who knows? But you get the email that says, OK, it should be done. And you log in. And what do you have? Three quarters. Exactly fucking right. Yes, you have three quarters of a server. Now you can't go back over there. Also, your manager is like, uh, did you, get, did you get your code onto the dev server yet? And now you're like, you're a little fucked, right? You're like, mm, uh, no, why not? What's the holdup? Uh, now you've got to throw Cat Lady under the bus. Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm waiting on the dev server from Ginger in dev server repair. Uh, your boss is like, oh, uh, do you want me to go over and have a, ch have a chat with her? You're like, no, 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 I think I can clear it out. So you go and you make one more try. And you go in person, and you're like, because no, email's not going to work, right? You're really going to put on your best cat-loving self. And you go and you make the appeal. And you, you know what you get. You get fuck off. Sorry. That's what you get. I've done you a favor. I did you another favor by doing the things I said I would do in the first place. Not very well. Now I just really can't do any more of this. Uh, I, you're really going to have to just submit the ticket and go through the regular procedure. And you're like, fuck, that takes like, in the banks anyway, it can take many, many, many months. So now you're screwed. You've committed to your boss that you're going to do this thing. You've kind of already thrown her half under the bus, but you don't want to throw her all the, all the way. And now you're shit out of luck. So back you go to your manager, and your manager just gets irate. So who does your manager go to? Goes to his director. Tells his director. His director gets, he's upset, you're upset. The director now is very upset. Where does the director go? Nope, not yet. He's got one more run. Goes to the VP. Does the VP get mad? Nope. Nope, because the VP is going to be playing golf with the head of operations later that day. And he's going to wait until that dude is right in the middle of his backswing to be like, what's up with Ginger in operations? Right? The guy slices his shot, mission accomplished. They have a talk. How does Ginger find out about the pressure that's been mounting on the dev side? Her VP is the U, right? It's the inverted U. Goes up, now it's coming down. Uh, whatever your relationship with, with Ginger was before this happened, by the time her manager has the chat with her, you won't get shit out of her for the rest of your career. You could be there for 100 years, you're not getting anything, right? So this is the impact that, that silos can have. We create, um, we create processes based both on success and past failure, but those processes can become super rigid. Uh, if you're in an organization that uses KPIs to measure, especially in operations, we do this quite a bit. We have KPIs, and those KPIs are meant to reduce costs and increase efficiency, and that is a valid pursuit. However, KPIs focus inward. You're constantly trying to shrink the cost and the time. Sorry, it's a key performance indicator. OK, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. So these are the metrics by which we reduce the cost and time involved okay. in doing something. But if you notice, over the life cycle of an organization, those KPIs become wedges that prevent the organization from growing. If you've ever worked with, and I, and I, I was both this person and worked with them, where you're managing, say, the, the CentOS build for 10,000 servers, which at Riot was a thing, 
When we come and say, hey, we need, to, we need to roll forward to the next version of CentOS, that can be a nightmare because this creates new work. Or we need to change the server profile, or we need to do whatever other change. Now all these KPIs are like, don't look outside the box. That's expensive. It's, we're all busy. Um, I hate to pick on the banks a lot, but in financial institutions, this is real. The, the financial constraints on organizations that provide services are so heinous that they will hire developers who have to wait six months before they can start working. So they're starved for development resources on the left side. They are constrained by, financial, uh, by, by these financial KPIs on the right side. And they literally hire people who can't do anything. There, I heard stories where they, so it, and again, this is, uh, this is both in the US and in other countries, where you have legitimate people all ready to go, can't get a laptop, or if they've got a laptop, they can't get access to, uh, to the domains. Now, I know this isn't your organization, but it is entirely real and entirely possible. All right, let me just move forward here. Um, part, of, part of the way that we shape culture is through our direct communication. There are good ideas, there are not so good ideas, and there's bad ideas, right? And part of the way that we use our human intelligence is to try to figure out what's what. It's important to remember, maybe not for you, but, but, but maybe for me, uh, that the purpose of those arguments is to get to the best outcome. If you're in an organization where it is not possible to discuss certain things or have certain kinds of conversations, or you can't get to something that moves you forward because the conversation ends in winning or losing a, a, a zero-sum game, you really have a problem. Uh, and again, these are the ideas that, that, uh, that DevOps were, was, is meant to address. So there's a bunch of stuff we can talk about in terms of tooling, but ultimately, and, and it's important, but ultimately what we're trying to get to is we're trying to get to the fastest good outcome we can get to, and, and, and the good outcome means safe, it means high quality, there's, there's a lot baked into that idea. All right, uh, lean has a value of respect. So um, Mike Rather, he's written quite a bit on the Toyota way, and, and if you're interested in, in, in Agile, uh, and Lean, he's a super good resource. Um, uh, I, I used to work with Jez Humble. He was my boss when I was at Chef, and, and he introduced me to Mike and his work. And this statement in particular has had such a huge impact on me. So respect is one of the two pillars of Lean and the Toyota Way. Uh, and it's such an important idea. There's, there's a quote in the Toyota factory, in a Toyota factory in Japan, like they have signage that goes over all of the, the core Lean values. And uh, one of the signs in Japanese reads, respect for people is the attitude that regards people's ability to think the most. So the idea is that our regard for our fellow humans promotes their ability to do well in the workplace. It's such a, such a, like, it's just such a, um, a, a strong way to lead in a conversation. Now, unfortunately, for the first 20 some odd years of my career, that is not how <laughs> those conversations went. I don't know what your workplace conversations are like. Uh, that was not my experience for most of my career. Most of my career looked like this. Right. So uh, Virginia Satir is a, uh, was a family counselor in the 70s. Um, I was going to draw you her change model, but I don't have a whiteboard. So I also couldn't draw the curve of Jeff Hackard swearing. I will draw it for you in the air now. It's a bell curve that looks like this. There's an S here, there's an F here, and there's an MF over here. And there's lots of dots in the middle. Uh, anyway, uh, Virginia Satir said that you know, the, the problem is not the problem, coping is the problem. So the problems that you see inside the organization are opportunities. Uh, this is the way that Lean would approach it. The problems that we see inside an organization are opportunities for improvement. When we don't seize those opportunities, we figure out other coping methods to deal with them. And that, she says, is the problem. So where we are coping, we're not moving forward. Does that make sense? OK, how's everybody doing? Just tired? Long day, all right. Let me know. Keep going? All right, good, good, good. All right, um, so what did I want to say about this? Yeah, so, um, so we want to automate as much as we can. 
And in the areas where we cannot automate, we need to be able to discuss, that, discuss what cannot be automated effectively. And in order to do this, we have to confront coping mechanisms that prevent clear communication. That would be the takeaway for that slide. Uh, Virginia Satir also talked about the five freedoms. So if you want to know how much, uh, how much freedom you have inside of your workplace, these are the core questions to ask. Do I have the freedom to see and hear what is actually present? So I'm going to give you an example. Have you ever worked on a project that could not fail and was failing? Just, just a quick show of hands. Just of all the hands. Uh, yeah, Are you, were you allowed to say that the project was failing? No, no. What, what, was the, what was the implicit threat? Yeah. Goodbye. Goodbye, yeah. The freedom to say what you think and feel. I feel shitty. I have been here 12 hours every day for the last month, and I don't think this project is going to land on time. Can you say it? No. Right? The freedom to feel what you want. I feel like I want to go home. <laughs> I feel like <laughs> if we had talked about this earlier, <laughs> we might have approached it differently. I feel like I'm not heard. Right? Um, the freedom to ask for what you want and need. I need rest. I need time to think. Right? I need whatever. Uh, and finally, the freedom to take risks and fail. You cannot scale an organization that will not take risks. So no matter what you're asked to do, if you know the organization you're in is risk averse, and you're asked to innovate, with all the love in your heart, you've got to say no thank you. OK, um, so let's talk about uh, Kaizen. Yeah, let's talk about Lean for a minute. Everybody down? OK, Kaizen. Awesome. Why is that important? <laughs> Without end, forever and ever. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. The spirit of continuous improvement um, really comes from this idea. I don't think I talk about it too much here, but there's, uh, is it Kamakuri? The mechanical improvements. So if you ever look in a, in, a, in, a, in a factory, you'll see all these like crazy little contraptions at different stations. And this is really the hacker ethos um, on the production floor. And, and we can do it as much as, as any other industry. Um, so all the little local things that we do to make the workplace safer and to make it more effective, this is the idea of Kaizen. We can constantly improve. This is also where the idea that teams need autonomy comes from. In, um, in the Toyota way and in Lean, the idea is the team that's responsible for the work can be responsible for the remediation of problems that they see. So you don't have a sign that says 472 days, uh, no, that says zero days since, since we last slipped in the oil, right? Because the team can see that the, there's an oil spill. They can diagnose and remediate the problem themselves, and they often do. Now, sometimes they need, the, they need management to help. So what couldn't the team do? They probably couldn't replace the robots that like weld the shit together. But they could come together to talk about why those machines are unsafe or not, not the best um, for the job. And they're usually heard. So uh, anyway, that's what Kaizen is. Kaikaku, who can tell me what that is? Ah, it's my favorite. This is big bang change. Sometimes continuous improvement isn't going to cut it, and you got to change, right? This tool sucks. Uh, you say that about every tool. No, this tool actually sucks. We need Buildmaster because Buildmaster is maze balls. We don't need the other thing, right? And then you make the change. So uh, we, we hear a lot of discussion about Kaizen. People don't talk about Kaikaku very much, but sometimes it's very important to move you forward. You can't half-ass everything. That's Zeno's paradox, right? right. Sometimes we just got to take a full step forward. Uh, Kanban. Yeah, it's a, visual, it's a visual indicator of work and flight. Very, very important. Um, if you are interested in, in how to be effective with Kanban, I'm going to make a suggestion. Uh, just read up on Little's Law. It's very easy to reason about. Little's Law is three averages. If you know two, you can deduce the third. So it's the average arrival, weight, arrival rate of work in your system. It's the average amount of work in your workflow system. And then it's the average exit rate. Right? Very simple concept. What your Kanban board is meant to tell you is whether or not you have too much work in flight. That's it. It's so simple. I've seen people like really go bananas with it, but it's really easy to deal with. Your cumulative flow tells you 
whether you have an excess of inventory, too much work to, to, to do. And then once you know that that's a constraint, then you can make decisions about how to deal with it. The work in progress indicators on your, combo, on your Kanban board, if they're missing, by the way, this is terrible. It's terrible because they become infinite cues. And they will just continue to flood with work. This is why you have that indicator. So you can adjust that dial. Sometimes I tell people to set it way up. Set it to 1,000, see what happens. Can you actually deal with 1,000 work units in this state? Probably not, but give it a try. The other thing people often say is set it to three. Set it all the way down and see what happens. But it's a dial that you can adjust until you hit the right pace of work for your team. Uh, the last is, uh, is Judoka. Anybody know? What's that? Automation. Exactly right. Yeah, exactly right. So um, this is, uh, Judoka is really the improvements in process that drive an improvement in quality. So it's similar to, uh, it's similar to Kaizen, but this is really the, the kind of automating the work that is dangerous and difficult. So why is it important to automate our infrastructure? Or automate any sort of, diff, uh, any sort of mindless task? Consistency. Exactly right. And what does consistency give you? Predictability. Predictability. What else? Uh, reduces risk. Exactly. Reduces risk, which is what we wanted, right? We're about to scale. Or we have scaled already. We want to take... Freedom from toil, exactly right. The hardest jobs in software engineering and in operations are the mindless, boring, like tedious jobs. That's where your finger gets caught in the machine mentally. Like we can't compare the suffering of like meat packing versus software engineering, but mentally it's difficult. What do senior engineers spend most of their time doing? The really fucking tedious configuration stuff. Why is that? Because it's the most risk. Right? Sorry to answer my own question. I get excited sometimes. Um, yeah, so Judoka is all the stuff that we do to automate away the danger and to increase the quality of the product. All right. I feel like I've given you something. You got a little lean education. Is it good? Yeah. I really, I really love it. I, listen, I was an Agile coach for many years. Here's what I'm going to tell you. Um, there's a lot of life coaches in Agile that don't write software. Is this going to be, this is going to be live? I'm probably going to get kicked out of whatever Agile group I'm in. Um, they are really kind people who mean well. Also, they don't do what we do in, on the main. There are also many people who do, right? The people I look to are the people who have an affinity for the work that we do and really understand it, so they're going to be able to speak to you. So, um, so Agile is good, and it's valuable, and those, um, those 12 white dudes who got together for a ski vacation and defined how we should all work together did a reasonably okay job. But there's lots of other ways to think about this and there's lots more voices. And Lean, I love the idea of it because I wrote a crazy, like, uh, I'm really gonna go nuts with this morning. I wrote a fuck ton of software over the course of my career. I'm pretty sure I didn't need to write like 70% of it. Someone's gotta maintain that shit. And I'm reasonably sure all the Perl code that I've ever written is still in the guts of the internet, right? It's still at work somewhere. The reason I'm saying this is that the, the one core value in Agile that I love is the, is the value of work not done. And that is what Lean is all about, right? It's about not having an excess of inventory or just-in-time delivery. You'll hear this referred to as waiting to the last responsible moment. There is huge value in avoiding work. Because every line of code that we write to solve a problem, someone has to maintain. Sadly, someone will have to read, as we discussed earlier. And that is no joy. Those people on Twitter, I, we talked about this earlier, but I'm just going to bring it back up again. Those people on Twitter who are like, you all ought to read everybody's code. I literally, I get so mad. I'm like, no. Uh, like you, I read Newth as a young engineer. I definitely believed that someday my code would be like poetry. That day has not come. <laughs> like, it just hasn't. It still looks like shit. It's still hard to read. Even like six weeks on, I'm like, uh, what was I thinking? Probably a better way. Like, I feel good if it basically, like, if PEP8 says OK, I feel OK. Uh, JavaScript, I, who knows what you're going to get from me, right? Maybe better now with TypeScript, but you just don't know. It's like a mixed bag. Reading somebody's code means trying to understand how they think. I barely understand how I think. So uh, I want to write the smallest amount of code that I can 
to solve the problem in the best way that I know how, and then I want to get somebody else to look at it and tell me if I fucked up or not. Okay. All right, we're almost done. So, oh, sorry, that was really loud. Um, the, last, the last sort of um, lean, uh, lean idea that I want to talk about is the and-on. And-on is a visual signal that lets you know about the quality or conditions of the process. The and-on cord allows you to stop the entire process when there is a defect-causing problem on the line. So and-on is our metrics. It's the metrics we use to examine our code. It's the metrics that we use to examine the performance of our application. It's our logging. It's our alarming. It's all of those things that tell us about the quality of our application. The and-on cord is the part where we can stop working when there's an actual problem and we address that problem. Does that make sense? Okay. Two super important ideas. All right, how are we doing? We're getting close. All right, continuous delivery. I think I told you I work for Jazz. If you read the book, he's, he's my favorite human. He's such a good guy. Also, if you read the book, Jazz was FTPing around his web app. Like the world has significantly changed since that idea, and it's a great idea. So if we go back even to John Alspaugh and Paul Hammond's talk, they talked about one button deploys, which you, I was looking at Buildmaster, press that button, that shit goes out, and you get a good visual indicator of what's happening in your process, exactly what you want. Um, uh, continuous delivery and continuous integration, I don't know how we lived without them. Uh, just back to Andon, by the way, remember they used to do it with the duck? Did anybody know what the duck is? So it was time to integrate, you throw the duck, no? Okay, so it's all right. It's an XP thing, maybe. Uh, anyway, you need a visual signal to know when to stop. Today we have pull requests. Back in the day, someone had to raise their hand and say, I think we've all been working too long. <laughs> it's probably time to merge this shit, right? Um, anyway, continuous delivery makes the whole process of merge and release much, much simpler. Um, in that talk, too, they, they, they talked about, well, anyway, it doesn't matter what they talked about. It's an important value. And the deal here is to ship change in small batches as quickly as you possibly can. So it, you know, Facebook does it, I don't know, up to a bazillion times a day, that's fine. You don't all have to be Facebook, right? Spotify does it sometimes. I don't know, the app doesn't change that much. <laughs> but it's probably changing in ways I can't see. Um, it's really about your context. The speed of continuous delivery, the rate at which you deliver software, has to do with your business context. Uh, I say this because I've worked with a lot of companies who've had consultants come in and tell them that they need to be Spotify or they need to be Facebook or they need to be whatever. You definitely do not. You understand your domain and your domain problems. You know what your customers need. Release as frequently as you need to in order to address their needs. The concern under the hood here is making sure that you have broken up the risk of that deploy into as small a chunk as anyone could handle. Make sense? All right. Tooling. All right, so we've gone all the way through. We started with culture. What, what, what do we say about culture? Be nice to each other. Have respect for each other. Right? Don't be an asshole. We talked about process. Just enough process to make improvements in, in, your, uh, in your workflow, and no more. If somebody comes to you with some highfalutin process that they learned in a book, that seems really complicated and doesn't meet an actual goal that you have, be polite, because they're your colleagues, be interested, because they're humans, and say no, right? Um, so same with tooling. You need exactly the right amount of tooling to achieve your goals and no more. Right? So you always need to be taking a look at why you're adopting and what you're adopting. Um, I, I think I told you I used to work at Chef. At Chef, when, you know, Chef does configuration management, does a lot of other things now, it's really great. Uh, there's lots of configuration management tools available in the world. You gotta find the one that fits you. Otter, I think, is the configuration management tool that, um, that Anito provides. Here's the thing, it, it, what matters is that you automate the things that are difficult. That's what matters. You could have the tool fights inside your <laughs> building all day long, and I know they happen. It's the least important part. The most important part is that you actually do that work. Right? Um, and it's the same with almost every other piece of tooling. 
there could be reasons why a particular tool is better in your environment. For sure, have that conversation. But if you're locked in advocacy fights without much context for your domain, you probably, you have other problems. That's the coping that Virginia Satir was talking about. Maybe someone is grumpy because they didn't get to decide or I don't know what, but, but that's not the core issue for you. Does that make sense? Okay. One more thing I'll tell you about tooling. Um, I, I've, I've heard the it's expensive argument quite a bit throughout my career. Um, I worked at a, at, a, at, a, at a company that makes a video game um, I, that I just won't say the name of right now because it's not a great story. Um, and we did deployments to tens of thousands of servers globally. Those deployments initially were done by a single dude who was an awesome dude, very brave, um, also probably lost 10 or 15 years of his natural lifespan because he was the guy, right? And those deploys took like 32 hours. Um, we automated that, but we automated much of the deployment process, and we drove it down to between 8 and 12 hours for, um, for a pretty large chunk of the planet, which is a huge improvement. Um, we then offered those improvements like to the organization to make use of. Now, there was a tool, an in-house tool that had been built that would do a very similar deploy process, and it was near and dear to the hearts of the people that made it. Here's the thing. You would deploy with that tool, it would succeed or fail, but you could not tell what had happened. So you could, you could apply a change to, say, 15,000 servers, and you would have some number of them that were in some funky state, and you wouldn't know why. What you would get at the end of this process was a very long list of all of the servers that the, that the system thought had failed, and you would know that because they wouldn't have a check on the checkbox. And what an engineer would have to do is he would have to go through and check those off individually. We're talking potentially thousands of checkboxes, right? This is not the kind of tooling you want. The, your goal in implementing tooling is to automate the risk away. It's to automate the steps away. So when you evaluate the tooling, um, this is really for anybody who has a brand, the brand name is the least important thing. The most important thing is that that tool automates away your risk and shows you what the fuck is happening under the hood. Make sense? Okay. How are we doing on time? We got time. Sweet. I am getting there. So what we want to do, we want to automate everything, discuss the rest. It's the hardest part. But I just really, really encourage you to, um, to find a way to improve communication. Could start with Ginger over there in, in operations who needs to get you the server. Could start with her manager. Could start with the person in the cubicle just over from you. But it's really good to look at the people that you work with as whole humans. Um, and in that way, you can Kaizen your way, you can Jidoka your way uh, to a much better world. So here's my answer to the original question. What was the question? Yeah. What do you think? Is it? Are any of the concerns that I've addressed still important? Probably. I agree. So yep, 10 years on, it's still a thing. <laughs> and that's it. Uh, I have time for questions, or comments, or drinks. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah? Oftentimes, you're the person in the structure that's at the bottom or below the person that can actually make the change. Yeah. And it can be very difficult just to get an audience, much, much less to get anywhere. Yeah. So if you have any thoughts or advice on how that. I do. I have, I, have, I have a piece of advice, and I have two thoughts. I'll give you a sandwich. <laughs> Thought number one. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I'll give you a sandwich. OK, so I talked a little bit about structure. So what you're talking about is your relationship to structure inside of your organization. Uh, I said uh, silos beget supervision. I, there's a longer version of this, where, uh, which I won't go into completely here. But basically, it's about permission seeking. Uh, permission seeking is the death of innovation. Okay. 
So uh, here's what I'll tell you. A better model, a, a model for organizational change that I know works is this. Uh, I call it the ELSA model, E-L-S-A. Event, so this is I take an action that I can take, right? Language, I discuss the action that I took. So a thing, it could be anything. It could be like you can't build, you can't use your own Linux build, or you can't do X or Y, Wh whatever the prohibition is, the thing that's holding you up. You take some concrete action toward resolving it, and then you talk about that. So event, language. The language creates structure, and it goes like this. You're like, hey, I did this thing right here. And then someone would be like, you can't do that. And you're like, uh, oh, well, uh, I did. <laughs> here it is, right? Um, and then that starts a conversation. Well, why aren't we supposed to do it? This thing helps. This, this path is moving us forward. Um, that creates uh, autonomy for you. In almost any environment, if you can demonstrate a change that's effective, meaning it actually moves you forward to an improved status quo, you're, you're going to get some agency to move forward. There are some organizational problems that you have to watch out for. So here, so this is the back end of the sandwich. So I think the first thing, uh, the thing to be aware of is that it sucks to be the agent of change. I do not recommend it as a job, as a, as a, as a thing you do in your organization. Um, this can be deflating sometimes, but here's the thing. Um, the agent of change is usually the first person run out of town. Right? So in my opinion, it's better to do things and it's better to work to empower like team or some make local changes that really help. This, Kaizen is really a, a blessing in many, many ways. What you're talking about is kaikaku. Can I change the mind of, of a person who has broader authority or capability than I have? Because what you want to do is you want to bypass the slow path and you want to get to the big change quickly. My experience has been uh, in organizations where that isn't possible because you don't hold that power it's better to start the process by using Kaizen, and then make the pitch. So you build a little bit of, you build some examples, and then you use that to make the pitch for the big change. The danger here is that sometimes you won't be the person who implements the change you see. And for some people, that can be very difficult. Does that make sense? So you might be successful, but it also might hurt. Someone's like, that's amazing. I'm also the VP of whatever the fuck you're doing and then they might want to take control of that. If you're cool with that and you just want to see the change happen in the world, you're going to be super happy. If you're not cool with that because you wanted to be the person who made the change, it could be, it could be spicy. Does that make sense? Yeah, if I need to tell you a story, then you can tell For sure. I am a collector of stories. Okay. Yeah, I'm really happy to hear it. Any other questions? Yeah. I have some more opinions and some advice. Um, okay, uh, I am and have been a, a leader in technology. I'm gonna tell you first, before I tell you anything else, what I do and how I think about it. So I do not, I, I fire high-performing assholes. Here's how I do that. I say, this is the clip. These behaviors have this impact. And if they continue, this will be the outcome. And I give them a crazy amount of leeway. But I don't tolerate high-performing assholes in the environment. Uh, so you might ask yourself right now, as, as I did myself when I was younger, oh shit, what's an asshole? <laughs> I, might, I might be one. <laughs> and, and I absolutely was one. So, uh, so here's what an asshole is. An asshole uh, is that person who shuts down communication within, within, a, within a team or a group. Software development and success in an organization is a team endeavor. So if you have someone who's squashing uh, people's ability to talk or share their perspectives, that person is not helping you. No matter how smart they are, 
they're actively eroding the culture, they're preventing you from retaining the highest quality people. You don't know what you're missing, because uh, frankly, that person is just pooping on everything. Sorry to your audience. <laughs> uh, so, so that's what I do. Um, so there's three definitions that I have though. So there's that sort of wet blanket, um, that depressive pessimist, that person who argues everybody to death. So that's number one. Uh, number two is aggression. Like I just, it's, I just can't abide it in the workplace. You can't be productive in an environment where people's amygdalas get set off. Um, I heard somebody say the other day that it's like, I don't know, some, some small number of seconds that it takes to recover from, from an, you know what I'm, when I talk about amygdala, do you know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about the, the, the fight, flight, and uh, faint part of your brain. It's, it's, the, uh, it's the part of your brain that regulates what you're gonna do when it's scared. So when you get angry, the amygdala is almost always active. You get this dump of cortisol and testosterone, and this creates a pretty toxic chemical soup in your head that can take hours to wear off. So if you bring your best, smartest people into a meeting and some fucker pisses everybody off, you have lost multiple person days of output as a result of that interaction. And he has shut down future communication on certain topics for who knows how long. Yeah, so he, I should say he or she, it's, it's not a gender thing. Um, although, let's face it guys. <laughs> it's often us. Yeah, so, so that's what I do. Um, so I said three things, right? There was the depressive pessimist, the, the, the aggressive person, um, Oh yeah, and the, and, the, and the arguer. Yeah, the person that prevents you from moving forward. Yeah, so those three behaviors you can't tolerate. And of course, any physical aggression or threat of it, you just out, right? You just can't deal with it. So, uh, so that's what I do. If you want to try to work with a team, there's a bunch of things you can do. Um, we start, Brian and I work with teams quite a bit. We start, from, we start by introducing the perspective that every member of the team is whole, capable, and intelligent. I say those words, um, and I demonstrate that belief in my interactions with all of the team. I will create space. I have ejected people from meetings. Like, I'll do all the things. So that, that runway to going off the cliff, it often entails interactions. Like, if I have somebody who's really smart and passionate, and that passion comes out sideways as aggression or poor behavior, I want to try to save that relationship, and I want to set that person up for, their, for future success. Right? But there's a limit. So you just have to be very, very clear with the person about where, where you are. The first conversation is the hardest. My experience has been you get to resolution very quickly. The unrepentant asshole will make it impossible for you not to fire them once the cat's out of the bag. And the person who didn't know the impact that they were having will often feel some shame and remorse, and they'll go out and try to do repair, and you can help make that happen. And once they make amends with their colleagues, you can get huge value, like really uh, a different dynamic in your team. So it's worth the risk. Managers, engineering managers especially, often have difficulty with these interventions. I, would, I suspect, because based on my own career, that that's largely because our core behavior was tolerated and may have been the driver for our financial and career success. It's hard to look back knowing that you behaved poorly in the past and then take action in the present. But I'm telling you, the change has to happen somewhere. And if we want to create, there's going to be like five, a five million job deficit in the US in tech. If we want to create an environment in which we can attract and retain the best and highest quality candidates, you have to work your ass off. You know, uh, and that begins by making sure that people respect each other. So just hold that as a core value and make sure that people see it and hear it, and you'll be OK. You'll know what to do. Thank you. Sure. Uh, yeah, happy. Anybody else? Oh, come on. I threw up like 50 Japanese words, and I'm not Japanese. And <laughs> somebody's got to be like, why did he make me look at all that? No, we all good? Ready for drinks? Yeah. High five. Thank you very much. <laughs>